Okay, I want you to start when you first went down on 34, you were going to the picket line. Could you start that story again? Well, uh, I went down. Uh, I, I caught me a, a trolley and went on to the picket line. See, my sister was working there. I mean, she is a picketing, but what, the time I'd be off would be on account of my children in a condition, you know, that the house was in without food. So I, that's why I wasn't on the picket line every hour. And I went, uh, went on and uh, got off the bus. There's a man that wanted uh, uh, me to come by his house and he'd go at the picket line with me. And so I, I had a daily worker in my bosom, you know. And when I went, when I went on there to his place, I found out that he wanted to use me. And I, 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 I didn't go for that. And so I asked him, was you coming on down to the picket line? Said, yeah, he'd be down right away. So getting back to the paper, you know, I seen it wouldn't do for me to, to let him uh, have the paper that I was, uh, you know, distributing. Uh, would have distributed it to him if he would have been a person that I felt like it ought to had it. So I found out what he wanted, and I went on to the picket line by myself, and there I stayed. And when we, uh, you know, uh, picket all all them them hours. And I got a lady when they broke up to would she let me go to her bathroom and she her and her husband and they said yeah and it just a you know a little piece one of the exposition you know houses they lived in. I went on down there and I come on back. I come on back, I thanked her for, you know, being so nice. And I come on back to the picket line, and it just about finished up, you know, there's uh, all going home. And as I was coming up, got about the side of where we was a picketing, and the po police grabbed me and my sister. And when they grabbed me, they Nearly burnt my arm, you know, bruised it, and put me in the paddy wagon, uh, whatever you call them, and carried me and my sister down to the resting. No, I don't like hand cutways, if I can fart. Okay. All right, now start with, put, they put you in the paddy wagon. And my sister, my youngest sister. She was uh, working there and was in the strike too. And uh, put us in the uh, Big Rock Jail. You know where that used to be? Well, the Big Rock Jail, that's where we stayed 74 days. We had to stay there 74 days without and hadn't committed a crime no more than you had. And you didn't know us. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff, you know, uh, we carried on, tried to teach the prostitutes, you know, to not, uh, you know, to throw themselves away and get in jail like they do and selling their body and so on. Well, we had to stay there a pretty good long while, 74 days, and the big rock is hard. So uh, what we did, you know, we we got 
I had to get her some, get her some lawyers, and we got two Afro-American lawyers. We got a, we got Mr. Benjamin Junior Davis and Mr. John Gear. So they liked to blow it up in that jail when that that was going on. But such as that had to come, you know. So we didn't care. We didn't pay no attention. We wasn't scared. Neither one of us. And she, she's still a living, but she's not in good health. She's in a home. Her name was Annie Mae Leathers. Well, we stayed there, and uh, Benjamin Jr. and Mr. John Gear. they just couldn't take it to that jail. Uh, Two white women are having black lawyers, Afro-American lawyers. But we had them just the same. Could you talk about uh, uh, blacks in the mills? What did they do in the mills? Well, there's a very few in there. They didn't have too many. I can't remis remember in, in our section, they didn't have any. His, uh, all the cotton mills, they wasn't working no black people. Except, you know, to clean up and to mop and to sweep some of their field. What did you feel about that? I felt just like I do today. Some of us white people can, can clean up as well as we can. I didn't. I don't like uh, nobody having to do dirty work, but you have to if you're keeping house or so on. But I, I don't want to put it off all on the black people. Could you talk about Angelo Herndon? Yeah, we talked about him to different ones. Uh, uh, to tell me about Angelo Herndon, but use his name. Uh, when when we'd use his name? No. When you talk, to, tell me about Angelo Herndon, but say, let me tell you about Angelo Herndon. Let me tell you about Angelo Herndon. Now, Angelo Herndon and uh, Mr. Otto Hall and I don't know how many, and a lot of Jewish people, they come, they had an organization, but I can't remember the name of it. The Jewish people had an organization. But they'd come in there and they seemed to be so pleased, you know, to see the Afro-Americans and see my mother is and her elderly woman and all talk. But they was, a, uh, I'm not going to try to hide it. They was a little ugliest thing went on at the table. My mother fixed uh, Mr. Otto Hall and all of us a good meal and Angelo Herndon and so forth. Well, when we sit down there, my daddy, this is something I shouldn't bring out maybe, but if it's in my heart, I know. My daddy, he spoke out and said he wasn't used to eating with people like that. And my brother, Archie Olean Leathers, he he was a, worked in the harvest fields, you know, and learned a, learned us a lot. And he just grabbed my daddy and give him a kick in the back and, you know, put him off away from the table. And I guess that kindly broke him from some of his prejudice, but some you can't get it out of. Could you tell me about, uh, talk about the Ku Klux Klan? Uh, well, you, I haven't told you about, he won my husband was took out, but later years I got married to him. Walter E. Washburn. He 
he carried a, he carried a, well, first I'll say this, the WPA had let Walter have a lot of land, you know, that anybody could get it, you know, it could stand up and sign for it. And this black minister, he, he didn't have a thing, nothing to eat or nothing, didn't have no church or nothing. So he went to, he went to work. Walter did uh, dividing the land he had and let him tend that to raise stuff, foods and stuff. And uh, then the little boy, the little boy got sick. He, the Afro-American son, I'll say the preacher. He is a preacher. He got sick and uh, had to be carried to a doctor. And so Edith and Walter had a car, a little truck or something. They carried him down to Auburn Avenue to Dr. Jackson. And he treated us poor people. I've been to him, carried my son too. He is a very good man, and uh, he he went ahead and 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 treated the little boy and everything, and he found out he needed circumcising, and uh, they had to keep a bringing him back till he got better. So uh, after that, the clan took Walter out. And this minister, Afro-American minister, and beat him yelly to death. He never did get over him. Now, my husband, when I got married to him, he is a electrician. He could do wonderful work with electric, you know. And his wife was an Indian woman. She is very lovely, and she wrote for the black Gets the black church. You know what that is, don't you? The black church. Well, she wrote against them. And we all were in sympathy with her. And she had to be, t Walter had to be taken in. And, you know, it's bad for him to stay out there. They might have got him and killed him. And oh, and my mother took him in and kept him and took care of him till he got well. And could you talk about the Roosevelts? The Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not too well read up on Roosevelt. Only what he, uh, what you know about what he put her through what I mean, say, in the WPA days and the electorate and a few things like that. I don't know as much about him, but for me, I don't trust any of them. I don't trust any of the money, the wealthiest people, but they didn't. Roosevelt done a lot better than a lot of the others, and his wife too. Did you ever write them? No, but but uh, when I got into that writing, you know, we used to keep when when Walter was living, we kept the road hot and kept the Congress and the Senate appointments with for me and Walter and this and that and other and about the wars and so forth. We was really busy all the time. But you, you never wrote Mrs. Roosevelt or, or Franklin D. Thanking. Did you ever write the Roosevelts yourself? Well, we, went, we had to, we wanted more, we went, we, we met, we made appointments with the Congress and Senator, 
and especially about wars, you know. We talked on wars, and uh, that's uh, about it. Now, could you talk about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn? Well, I associated with her some. Could you say, I associated with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn? I, I don't uh, remember what all we associated about. Let's see. Gurley Flynn was uh, in the Communist Party, wasn't she? Well, I knew her, and see, we didn't have money to go down there. That's where we should have went and seen and talked. According to what little I know, I think uh, Gurley Flynn was a good uh, person. But you don't recall picketing with her or going to meetings with her? Beg your pardon? Did you picket with her or go to meetings with her or anything like that? You mean uh, Gurley Flynn? Yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't, don't think so. Mm -hmm. I want the truth, all I'm no, telling right, you. Right, right. Nothing but truth. Now, you, you've been political all your life. Yes, I have. My mother, my mother was a, was a, really a political person all her life, and especially after. She got married and had children. She wanted to teach them. And she's the instigator that I inherited a lot of my, you know, things. She had a good head on her. I, I, everybody might not think she did, but she really did. Could she read and write? Uh, yeah, she could read and Right, but not too good. But she is a great hand to save all the clippings of the devilments that are going on in the newspaper and Ku Klux and so forth, the killing people and so on. Could you tell, you told me a story about how your parents saved a black woman once. Could you tell that again? When the mill got... Uh, said that the blacks were going to get you? Well, start that, to tell that whole story. I remember, I remember that. You know, there's a, in East Point, Georgia, they were a little place, I guess it's still there, I don't know, called Clark's Cove. And those people in Clark's Cove was all... Afro-Americans, and they were, they were shooting, hanging, all of the black people over in there. That was just a little piece from the Elizabeth Cotton Mill where my sisters worked, and I'd carry them a lunch, carry them their lunch, breakfast, and uh, that, that, that woman, uh, uh, my mother's friend, she she was uh, she happened to break a loose from Clark's Cove and come over to my mother's. I guess you'd call it about a half a mile, uh, might have been a mile from East Point to where we lived in Elizabeth House, and. They come around the superintendent, at, uh, you know, the superintendent sent somebody around to warn everybody that lived there. They had to come in the cotton mill that night by before dark, and that uh, woman that my mother had there. You know, she 
told her. We had to obey the rules, you know. We thought we did. I guess they'd have killed us if we hadn't. We had to all, the children and babies and all had to go in the cotton mill and stay all night. And when it got dark, this woman, I think her name was Minerva. She, my mother's friend, she, uh, you know, got there just a minute too full dark. And my mother, you know, told her to just keep quiet and uh, so on. She had done told her about what, how they was killing them and hanging them over there. So what happened? The man come around. Uh, maybe it's done told that once. But anyhow, we had to go to cotton mill that night. Babies and all, children. We went to the cotton mill and stayed down there practically all night. And my mother had uh, Minerva, I believe was her name, had her when she left that night to go to cotton mill. She told her, says, now you get in this closet here and don't you dare to get out because Minerva, you'll get killed. And she knew she would because it's killing them up at Clark's Cove. <laughs> so that's what happened. Okay. And stop it just a moment. Now, it's rolling. Okay. My shortness of breath is causing me being yeah. so slow. Okay. My blood pressure is so low. Yeah. So the doctor said. Okay, you want to tell me the story again? Oh, concerning the uh, having to go in the cotton mill. Well, uh, the man come around to give orders to everybody in the, to go in the cotton mill that night before dark. And uh, we had to do it. So my mother said I either be run out. And that's what happened. My mother had one head in the clock. She hid her in the closet, you know, when we left. And so we went to the cotton mill. I remember it as well as this today. So uh, we stayed down there all night. No food. So we s stayed. That wasn't just our family, that was everybody in the village was a mile long. Well, that's about all I kn No, you see, what we don't know is that the woman was Afro-American and that they were threatening that if you didn't get into the cotton mill, the Afro-Americans would be after you. That's what... You see, when you tell the story, we don't know that because you just say one, but you don't say that she's Afro-American. Mm -hmm. Could we dare try it again? Well, you want me to say that, tell the, like it was? Yes, uh -huh. but be sure that you say that Minerva was an Afro-American. Oh, yeah. Didn't okay. I say it? No, <laughs> no, you didn't. Okay, try it again, Jenny. Roll well, my mother had to go in the cotton mill, and she she had a, a, a Afro American in her house, one of her friends, and I'd like to say this too, Dad. My mother was prejudiced with no nationality, no Jewish, Italian, or nobody, none the Afro American. Well, anyhow. We had to stay in the cotton mill all night, and my mother had left that Afro-American in the closet. She was very anxious to get back. And that's about all I can say. 
But now, why did the, why did you have to go to the cotton mill? What well, reason did they give you? Well, the reason they said we'd have to go to the cotton mill that that the at the Afro Americans was coming in and kill us all, and the babies too. Is that enough? Yep, that's it. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay. Thank did you. I get it? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Now, Jamie, mm -hmm. uh, I'm. Uh... Is that funny or suspicious in me of keeping this? What is it? Pencil. Can a pencil? It's a pencil pen. You wanted to see it, didn't you? Yeah. That's what I got the Ro sign the Rosenbergs uh, petitions. Let the people sign them with that. I see. Well, Ethel and Julius. That's when I got in jail again. Well, tell us about being in jail again. Well, I tell you, the police live right close to my sister had owned a house. And that house was Leo Frank's uncle. And it was a very wonderful house, built solid. And this, this police, it was there, Leo, down on Pryor. And, and it's just on the corner where my sister's house was, across the street. And I, my sister and I were going up Pryor Street getting petitions, trying to get petitions signed to save the lives of the Rosenbergs. And then this, uh, this old man, as a police, he is, he is considered very vicious to everybody I ever heard speak of him. But he arrested me, but he didn't arrest my sister. Now, I mean, my, a different sister, uh, many, many was my old, older sister than this and it stays with Nellie or did till she put her in the home. The one that is in jail with me. Uh, anyhow, he put us in jail for, peti for getting petitions signed to save the life of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. And I don't know of anything could have been any, any viciouser than that. How long were you, were you in jail that time? I don't remember how long I was there. We didn't stay in there as long as we did before when we was in the strike. But old Wooster, He's not living today. You've outlived most of them, haven't you? Yes, I have. <laughs> I'm not worrying about that part of it. I'm just worrying what, I, what I've done to try to help humanity, yeah. regardless of what they are, Jewish and uh, Greeks or Afro-Americans or what. You think you've done enough? No, you don't okay. never do enough. Do you, th do you think you've done enough? No, not at all. I ain't done enough. I might be doing little things you don't know nothing about. <laughs> no, I'm not as stout as I have been. I've been a stout hussy. Are you still a member of the Communist Party? Well, in my heart, but I don't know nothing about the Communist Party, how it's a going now. I haven't since I left Douglasville. That's been a quite a while. Now, as far as 
I'd like to read the paper and get the paper, but I don't know where I'd land at. I don't get the Daily Worker. It used to be the Daily Worker, but it's the Daily World now. At least it changed it back. What would you like to do next? Uh, <clears throat> okay.